episode of the Cannon Club. I am super excited to be talking about a win. Arsenal are back to winning ways with a 5 0 win over Palace. Palace. It was almost like they weren't there. It could have been anybody. You could have told me it was anybody, and I would believe you because it was all Arsenal, no Palace. Really good game, um, loads of goals, tons of things to talk about. And on today's show, I have the pleasure of talking to Femi. Harry and Laura. Laura, this is Laura's first time on the Cannon Club, so um, make sure you're nice to her. I know you guys will be, but um, yeah, guys, we're gonna go ahead and hop in with the huge. Uh, one word to describe how you're feeling about Arsenal right this moment, Femi. I'm going to go just anticipation. I feel like Crystal Palace is cool. Five O was cool, but. I've, I'm also, I have like a lot of Crystal Palace fans as like, you know, just people who I follow and they're kind of like, well, kind of expected it because we kind of haven't really been that good lately. And watching the end of the game, it was like, they kind of stopped playing defense. So it's like, mm, okay. So it's more of, okay, that was cool, but I'm more so anticipating. It was like, how are we going to grow from this? So anticipation. Harry? I'd say cool. It felt cool. It was a cool game. It was cold, really cold. Um, so I'm like a mixture of cool and yeah, that was that was good. That was all right. It was like it was five nil, but it was it it was like mm, this is fun, but we're not. Are we playing well? We're playing well, but Palace are really really poor. Um, so I would say cool but I want more in one word, put it all together. Perfect. Laura? Man, you guys are a bit more negative than I, I thought that we were going to be on here, but I get it. I get it. Um, I'm going to go with settled. I think I completely agree. Let's not get carried away. It was Palace. They were dreadful. Um, but I just feel after the you know festive season, all the sort of, you know, difficulties we've had to put five past palace is is fine i'm settled it's not you know we're not going to get too carried about with it but it's just a little bit of a stabilizer on a rocky period so i'm settled i'm okay i'm cool as well harry are we spoiled you know yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes 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 i think <laughs> I, I think we had um we had a rocky patch we had two weeks off the players had a lovely week in Dubai. I think I know what I knew I was hoping for like some really like show stopping football. That's what I wanted. Not to say that we deserve it or it's guaranteed, but I know I was looking for some real free flowing football. Um, and not to say we didn't get that, but I just felt like, ah, oh, after we went one, one nil up so early, I was thinking, oh, that's great. Now we can really, really go for it. And it didn't feel like it was it was clicking. But like I said, I don't want to sound ungrateful. I'm very happy with the win. Very happy. And I would take five nil every week. But I think because as we've seen the previous 18, 19 games, and we've almost had a similar feeling for most of the games, which is like, yeah, we've done well, but there's more. I feel like as we're entering crunch time, I want to see that next level. I want to see us like really open teams up and bounce passes off with like huge intensity and create like lots of chances. I know it's hard against the low block. So I wouldn't say we're ungrateful, but I think I'm just mindful that for us to close the gap, we're going to have to really start putting in some convincing performances as well as really convincing scorelines. You know, it's interesting. I feel like I, I'm, I'm, I feel like I almost, I loved last season. I thought it was great. Um, mostly because the football was amazing from minute one. It was, but maybe there has to be a little bit of an acceptance that this team is going to be different because we're, we keep talking about this click that's supposed to happen. I don't think that Arteta wants us to have attackers that are consistently what people would consider out of form. You know, I don't necessarily feel like our attackers are in as a group in form. But I also we know Mikel. It's been four and a half years, and he's very uh, he, what he what we do on the pitch is what he wants us to do. Like I feel like this is all by design. And so I'm not saying that he wants us to play worse football, but maybe he's more concerned about things being efficient and getting the job done rather than the aesthetic part of things, because there's been a lot of talk about the over-reliance on set pieces. 
this has to me, this has to be by design. Maybe Arteta is not really as concerned about playing the Arsenal way. He's more concerned about adding more tools to the toolbox. And maybe we kind of need to get used to that because we're anticipating this big click. But I'm starting to get to the point where I'm feeling like that may not happen. And we may just this may be who we are. You know, we either get a get a set piece, you know, the goals here and there, keep it tight, you know, make sure that we don't concede. But maybe the free flowing aspect of things is not going to come. Thoughts on that? It's it's interesting because I think I go coming from last season to this season, I felt like the first thing that I would always say was it seems like this season was the season of like finding solutions based off of which game. And I'm starting to realize that the players that we have, specifically the ones that play in like the starting 11 versus like, you know, who comes on and how we do it dictates how we play. So even as much as like looking at the differences between like Rice and Jorginho, you would go and be like, oh yeah, one does this better than the other. But if you kind of just look at it, it's like, I think it's just kind of a joy to be able to be like, there's days where we can be compact as hell. There's days where it's like, okay, things aren't going for us. We can we can get a couple set pieces to really loosen up a defense. Or there'll be games where it's like, hey, okay, we might have some spit like, you know, Champions League, we might have some space behind. Let's put some, you know, deep line playmakers in the back and let's just let it fly and let our attackers kind of just kind of run loose with the space. So I I, I get it. Um, and I understand how, like, you know, we look into last season, especially the first 22 games or so. We're kind of like, yeah, this is this is – this is sexy. I like this. I, I just, I think it's like, as much as I do remember and love and envy that feeling, I also think of like, wow, like we are the best set piece team in the league right now. That's kind of, that's kind of cool. And we're one of the best transition defend, uh, defending teams in the world right now. I kind of like that as well. So I think is again, the anticipation of, I want to see all of our players come back, but at the same time, I kind of want to see what this looks like in terms of okay arteta you have the tools to morph this team into what you want it to feel like whenever you feel like it let's see it so again anticipation we keep saying that today i don't know about like you guys with the looking back on last season i feel like we just there was a lot of kind of like romanticizing about it and i think part of the reason we watched such like amazing football last season is because teams weren't expecting it from us it was literally like where has this come from we're playing the arsenal way out of nowhere um having you know lost out on the champions league in you know gutting circumstances i actually have no problem this year with how they're set up to play and i agree with you femi he is demonstrating a little bit more versatility in terms of how he sets up the games and how he kind of pulls the strings where we need to I do not care if we play ugly football when we need to, and we can only beat the team that's in front of us. Palace were dreadful. Um, and I think, you know, to be able to put five past them, um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't our, you know, our best performance, but I think given the kind of, given what happened at the end of last season, you know, we played beautiful football and won nothing. Um, I don't really care if we're more pragmatic, more versatile, and we are more flexible in terms of the, in terms of the approach this season to beat what is in front of us and not the ideal way. Um, I still think we are trying to, to score the perfect goal. Great. But in the absence of that, while they're doing that and it's not coming off, if we're just chucking in goals from corners, so be it. So be it, basically. Sorry, I was typing something. I'm here. I promise. Okay, so, no, I, I agree with that. I think that um, there's romanticizing last season and there's like almost like a a lack of uh, looking at things from like the full perspective that we've seen teams in the past win the Premier League and not play good football. Jose Mourinho did not play good football. He didn't. He kept it compact. He defended and they nicked every, almost everything 1-0. You know, so it's, it's not like a, out of the realm of possibility that we can win things with a different style and, you know, we have different ways of winning. Like sometimes we can play on the counterattack, which we saw like in this game. almost. You know, the three open play goals were all kind of counter attacky goals where it was very quick and like direct. Uh, we can do the, you know, breaking them down with nice, neat passes. We saw that. We did that against, I think it was Brighton. We scored one of our, in my opinion, goals of the season that way with Zinchenko and Jesus and everybody involved. And then against Crystal Palace as well, like two set piece goals. I, I, I give them both to Gabrielle. Let's be serious. Gabrielle should have been credited with that goal, the second one. But, um, our own Omanstro, you know, he was so good. And like, 
I think in any other circumstance, if we weren't so like anxious about everything that's going on with Arsenal, we would maybe be a little bit more relaxed about the fact that we have defenders that can come in and score goals as well. And so I did want to spend some time talking about Gabrielle because he just doesn't ever really, in my opinion, get enough praise. And whether that's within our fan base or outside of our fan base, it's just like this thing, like he's just there. But that's like, what, three goals already this season that he came up with um, on set pieces so far. Um, He's been outstanding and not just the goals that he scored, but I felt like his energy yesterday was, was great. It was almost like um, if he had the armband, I think we'd call it a captain's performance. Um, he's definitely growing into like a leadership position, in my opinion. Like he, he may not be the leader or whatever, but I feel like he's growing into that role. And so I just wanted to kind of talk about Gabrielle's role um, yesterday with the two goals and the way that he played and how much he's improved since being like 22, coming into the team, playing with David Louise, being labeled, you know, somebody error prone to somebody that I cannot remember his last error guys I can't remember the last time that he made a mistake it's been a long time so has he I made think... one this season has, has he made a like a no, I, don't I don't think, think so no. I think Saliba does though and, that, and that's the funny part like but I don't think Gabrielle has this season Fulham at home no I'm all right. that was last year wasn't it yeah he wasn't uh... even playing then remember oh no he wasn't he was, no yeah he yeah. wasn't even in the game yeah he didn't he start dropped. playing until Palace? Do you guys yeah, remember yeah, yeah. the meltdown? Like in the beginning yeah. of the season when he didn't play the first couple games and, and everyone was like, oh my God, he's going to be out. He's out. Of course, he's overrated. And I was like, I don't think so. I, again, which again, we were talking about earlier. It's kind of like the tool. We have this tool chest of like players and, and how we're working in terms of what setups and what they're going to do. So. I don't know. Like, Gabriel's been sensational this season, and even a lot of last season. Like, sensational. The funny but, thing is that I think the, the meltdown about him not being there was about whether he'd have it? gone to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, there were rumors, right? The, the funniest yeah. thing is that he probably would have been back by now. He probably would have seen it and done a Jordan Henderson and been like, nah. Listen, no, no, not for me. that league not for me. is... Just, so, yeah, with a whole thing. lot more money in his bank account, but yeah. this isn't for me, but I'm rich as hell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, Gabriel is um he's an interesting one because he he's always available, which obviously like we're hoping that whatever happened at the end of the game doesn't keep him out, but he's always available. He's a part of, you know, in my opinion, one of the like the best center back pairings in the league. He he he's doesn't have those errors in him like he did before. And he he might be like the top defenders like is like the defender that scored the most goals in the Premier League like he has some he has records too I have to look them up but nobody talks about him and it's strange and the importance of the goal that he scored or the two goals that he scored against Palace is they broke the game open and I know Femi you and I were talking about this and like I think we have a little bit of a difference of opinion but I do think goals that open up the game and get you the lead or give you equalize or get you ahead or whatever hold a little bit more weight and for him to go out there and, and help us do that, I think was important because we know how we can kind of be against West Ham and Liverpool. We saw it. If we don't score in the beginning, we start to panic a little bit and then the goal doesn't come. And so I'm glad that he did that because it was like, okay, now we can relax a little bit. And that first one, he dunked on Chris Richards. I'm sorry. Like he dunked on him. I mean, it was the flight. It was the bah! It looked like somebody that was like bah! It looked like it could have been basketball. It was mm. so good. I loved it. It was quite. It was I quite like it. a looped corner from Declan Rice as well, because it wasn't like yeah. a mad amount of pace on the corner, so you could almost watch it for a long time. And then Gabriel, yeah, just met it perfectly. He's so good in the box. He comes alive like he really does. And I'm yeah. just looking at his stats for us now. So he scored like two in 2021 and five in the next season, three last season, and two this season already so he's definitely I mean it actually it should have been three right because that second one as you mentioned was definitely his goal as well uh, but yeah he's really come on and I feel like he now uh, internationally as well he's also getting more recognition with Brazil he seems to be playing a lot more games as well with Brazil so I think that probably helps his case and helps his confidence and he and he's cut out those cheap fouls and cheap yellow cards as well this season it feels like that was one big criticism of him last year he felt like sometimes a little bit too rash in the challenge mm. um 
But this season, he feels a lot more calmer, maybe uh, less emotional uh, in defending, which is good. Um, so, yeah, I, I still feel, feel like he can improve more. I still feel like he can improve on the ball a little bit more as well. But I think at 26 years old, he's uh, a great age. And, um, yeah, hopefully he sticks around for a few more years. And him and Gabriel can stay fit. Uh, obviously, sorry, him and Saliba. Obviously, what I'm always worried about is just injuries, you know, and how we how we replace Gabriel if he does pull up. So whether that's a key wall or it's, you know, moving Ben White into central or, or you know, if Tommy Asu's fit. So hopefully we can keep that pair in fit because that kind of feels like a Rio and Vidic kind of partnership. It feels like it has that yeah. status, you know, they're just both massive geezers who are like fast and love to get stuck in. So, yeah, happy days for a centre half pairing that will hopefully be around for a few more years at least. Agreed. Stat of the day. Stat of the day. He only has one yellow card this year. Singular. Yeah. One. Yeah, yeah. One. Yeah, so that's good, right? That's an example of just him being a little bit more calmer in the challenge, mm. less rash, less emotional, which is good. Hopefully, he can keep it up. It um, also shows that when you're young, like, you can get better because I feel like the weird thing about Gabriel is he never really got that he's young benefit of the doubt that everybody else gets. When he came to Arsenal, he was like 22. And he was playing in the bad Arsenal team where some of these other players are coming into like a good, settled, like balanced team. He came into the bad Arsenal, you know? And so at 22, to be making the mistakes that he was making 22, 23, and for some people to have written him off and called him like, you know, he's air prone and all this kind of stuff for him to be like, what, 26 now? It's like, yeah, it's normal for players to kind of be, they could be a little, you know, they could have little mistakes in them here and there like Saliba has in. He has those as well, but he's nipped those in the bud. And I, I just feel like there was a lot made of Gabrielle not being good when he was just a young player developing. He didn't get that benefit of the doubt. And I don't really understand that. Like, I, I, I just, I, I don't know. I just, the way I look at it, especially the more that I watch Arteta and the more I watch, was like, okay, what does he want with some of the players he wants specifically in the back? He's very kind of like, take the risk. I prefer you take the risk and fail than you not take the risk. I, I've noticed it with uh, the Raya Ramsdale situation. I've noticed it now with some of the ways our center backs have played over the years of who we've had. There, there's, there's, there's this thing about confidence, of just being confident with some of the decisions you're making. And we'll think about the repercussions later. And I think Gabrielle has kind of learned that balance of like, okay. I'm going to take risks, but I'm going to know when to take that risk. I know I can be like, you know, I'm faster, stronger than a lot of these people, but does it make sense for me to slide in right now? And I think with age and, you know, game experience, I feel like it then turns into you into someone like this since you have like, you know, a team that lets you know, like, even when you do make a mistake, we got you. I don't know. I yeah. think it all comes together, which makes Arsenal a really good team to develop young players. I, I just strongly believe that we just right now in terms of how we, are just as an institution. I think we're very good at like, hey, make your mistakes, do what you need to do, but in, regardless of what happened, we got you. I think we're seeing the benefits of that with Gabrielle now being this 26 year old wonder of a center back at the, at the moment. Yeah. Agreed. And so he has, okay, so Arsenal have the most goals from set pieces. We have 13. Um, and we have the third highest percentage of goals from set pieces. Only Everton and Luton have more. And I think that's where the panic kind of sets in is because you're looking at it and you're like, okay, we score maybe more set piece goals than other teams. Like the teams that are around us are Everton, Luton, and Wolves. Like I think in most circumstances, you don't want to be in and around those teams, but we are scoring goals and we're getting them from somewhere. And so I would say, I mean, you could even maybe argue that like player of the season or person of the season is Nicholas Yoger. You know, he gets so much criticism um, when we don't do well on set pieces, but I feel like he's ultra creative. He He's holding his weight. You know, I think whatever he's getting paid, he's he deserves the paycheck because we're getting bang for our buck in terms of the set pieces. So, and it's funny because the commentary was making like this big deal about isn't it strange that he stands up on the sideline when we're doing when they're doing corners? Isn't that weird? I'm like, why do you guys always try to make something weird that's not weird? It's different, but it's not strange that he stands up. He's the one that he orchestrates all this stuff. 
We have a goalkeeper coach that's really involved. We have a set piece coach really involved. And I think Arteta takes um, like a little bit of uh, inspiration from like American football where you have like um, special teams, a defensive coach and stuff like that. So Nicholas Yover st- standing up there and orchestrating his own artistic, you know, situation that he's put together in his mind. It's not weird to me. I like it. I like innovation. You know, I wasn't too down with the two number one goalkeepers, but this I like because we've been in a pa- in the past, a team that didn't really score off of set pieces. Now, here we are, you know? So Nicholas like Yover... I like it. He also, you know, he, he, the way that it's made out is that he's some sort of like Sunday league chump and that he's just got us there, hoofing it into the box and hoping that someone gets on the end of it. If you look at the kind of breakdown of analysis, as you said, Jess, it's creative and the kind of the screens that are put in, the blocks that are put in, it's not just a kind of let's, you know, honk it into the box and hopefully one of the uh, centre backs will make the right, right run. He also, come, you know, he's come from Man City. He comes with a very good pedigree of, you know, creative football. It's not just kind of he's come in to kind of get us some cheap goals. And I think having the ability to score from set pieces is a little bit like, you know, a tennis player who has a really good serve, right? That is a load of free points. You know, Djokovic is amazing, but, you know, in, in other areas, but he's also got a really, really good serve. That means that he has a load of free aces during, you know, during his service games. So if Arsenal can, when the other players um, that we might expect to score from open play are not, I've got no problem with us having the highest set piece, you know, percentage. I think we've scored 10 of those from corners as well. Um, And it's one of those stats where I'm like, it doesn't feel that major because we also have created so many chances from open play. We just haven't, we haven't taken them. So I think there's, you know, when you look at that stat, I don't, you know, you'd expect to be like, I can remember each and every one of these set plays. I was literally thinking to myself, I actually can't remember quite a few of these because the dominant kind of thing for Arsenal over the past couple of, you know, this season has been loads and loads of chances from open play and then goals from set play. And I'm I'm all for it. Um, and I think it, it speaks of a kind of football snobbery that, you know, set pieces that are in some way less important. I do not care. We have not scored a goal for three or four games or however many it's been, so I'll take it. Great. I'll I will take it. I will absolutely take it and, and long may it continue. It's just we cannot rely on it against the better teams, yeah. basically. Not everyone is going to be as poor as Crystal Palace defending them. But you know, we can only play the team that's in front of us. They were terrible at defending that set piece. Fine. Yeah. And Arteta hey. did say that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Femi. All I was gonna say is some of the best Champions League games were won on set pieces. Just saying, like, <laughs> it's just nice to know that we can do it. I mm-hmm. I hear it. I and I think it's an anomaly that we're mi- some of the shot, some of the goals that we we scuff. I'm gonna be honest with you. It's getting annoying now because it's like I I just watched the Liverpool game and I watched them create 0.12 xg in the first half and then end the game with four goals. Like I, I I'm getting annoyed because it's like I'm looking at the, the goals they're scoring and the goals we're missing. And it's like, you know what? Thank God we're scoring set pieces because I would I would be at Arsenal right now. Because it's just it's just so annoying. But thank God. Thank God at least set pieces are going for us. I mean, I feel like this may be unpopular to say, but I feel like we were having those moments at the beginning of the season. I feel like we had a lot of deflected goals that went in at the beginning of the season and we had made our luck early on in the season and it dried up a little bit. And now we're kind of not papering over the cracks, but we're using our set pieces and other ways of scoring to kind of like get us through where Liverpool have that as well. I think you create your own luck um, by getting into those positions. Like I remember early on in the season, there were a lot of rivals saying, well, Arsenal are just winning because they, you know, the Martinelli goal deflected into the back of the net. Oh, but Declan Rice, he shot and it, it got deflected. <clears throat> you make your own luck and the variance goes your way right now. It's going Liverpool's way at the beginning of the season. It's going ours and it's fine. It's fine margins. So you have to find other ways to score goals. And we're definitely doing that. The third goal though, that we scored guys, I loved it. That was that to me, that was the goal of the game because my boy Raya is coming. He's coming to life. I knew it. I, knew I, I it. might I knew actually it. make it out the hood because you guys, <laughs> Being Team Raya has not been fun. It is not fun. <laughs> it's been the pits. But he, I just want to see Raya play with confidence. 
that's it. I know he's a good goalkeeper because you just don't become shit overnight. It just, it doesn't happen. And it looks like that, that uh, leap up from Brentford to Arsenal, you know, was, was a difficult one. He came in with a lot of scrutiny. Obviously you're, you're taking the spot of a favorite, you know, it, it just hasn't been smooth sailing, but he's a permanent signing. Whether that's been officially announced or not, it's happening. And so no matter what, I just want him to do well because he has qualities that I feel like we should be using. And one of those was on display against, um, against Crystal Palace, which is he seems to understand how to uh, take advantage of situations where teams are discombobulated a little bit and turn those into quick attacks. He did that. We, we didn't talk about it a lot because we lost the game and it was tragic, but against Fulham. That's how we scored our one goal against Fulham. He threw it out. So those are little things like set pieces that aren't glamorized, that people don't really care about. But it was 10 seconds from Raya throwing the ball out to the ball being in the back of the net from the Trossard finish. Everything about that goal was what I expect from an Arteta side. You know, being creative, using, you know, the other teams like, you know, being scattered and using their attacks to be changed into our attacks. Like, I think Arteta does really well with those types of things. So, Harry, what did you think of the goal? You were in the ground. Yeah. How I liked, fast I, was it? <laughs> it was it was fast. It was fast. I think um, Raya deserves some praise for the throw out. I feel like because there has been a lot of backlash towards Raya, we're also like over egging what he's done a little bit without. Do you know what I mean? It's like it was a it was a very good pass out, a very good throw. But I feel like. Ramsdale would have done the same thing. By the way, I, I really like Raya as well, but we've got to get a little bit of the balance. It's not like he, you know, threw this ball like a hundred yards. It was like Harry's a straight later. throw. It's no, official. not at all, man. And then yeah, trust. So yeah, really good to exploit, you know, Palace over, over committing um, from a corner. And yeah, I think Raya overall had a, a really solid game. You could see. I'm not sure if you've seen his passing map, but you can see his starting position from some of the passes is so high up. So he really gives us that over, over what Ramsdale does. Um, he made that one uh, kind of fluffy kick where he recovered with a good save, but otherwise he was like faultless. And I think he'll, yeah, he'll grow into the game now. And also, let's not forget when you go one nil up, two nil up, you know, it makes it a lot easier for him as well. There's less pressure because the team are more confident on the ball. So a lot of it is about that as well. If you if we took our chances against Liverpool, you're talking about sorry, not Liverpool, um, the games before against West Ham, you're talking about a really good couple of performances. But because we're not taking our chances, mm -hmm. and then we can see cheap goals, it makes it harder for him. So. I think hopefully now we can really see Raya kick on and like get those clean sheets, get those stats up and then slowly but surely try to win over the fans, which feels like a weird thing to say, right? When you play for Arsenal and you're playing at home, that the fact that you have to feel like you have to win over your own fans. But hopefully, you know, the fans can start to see it now and and we can almost, sounds harsh, but forget about Ramsdale and just focus on, you know, bigging up Raya and making sure he's like the best version of himself when he's playing. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of playing out from the back as well, um, yeah. which we haven't had to do in recent games. I feel like a lot of people just allowed us to just to go into their, their half and just say, oh, break us down or whatever. But it felt like we were doing a lot of like intricate passing out from the back. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. But Raya was a big part of that, and he does take a lot of touches. And I think that's the reason why you know Arteta and um, <clears throat> Kanya really like him is because he's comfortable and likes to do those things. And so sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't, but it's just nice not to have a goalkeeper conversation. Speaking about goalkeepers is just a nightmare. Yeah, but it I love that, is. by the way. I love the way he continuously plays out from the back. Even at the Emirates, you can hear so many fans be like, you know, just clear it, just clear it. And when he fluffed that kick, that was because of like a, a combination where we kind of overplayed a little bit. But I like that because you have to do it, right? You have to do it. And you can't pick and choose. I don't think you should pick and choose when you do it. I think you should try to do it all the time. And I love that every ball that comes back to him is almost controlled with like the studs of his boot and he rolls it out and he's ready to play. Like he's, he's essentially like a five-a-side player playing in goal. So I, I love it and, and long may that continue. I think um, I think the, the last thing he should do is go back to maybe being like a reserve version of himself. Just go out and be like totally confident in what you're doing and, and how the manager is asking you to play because ultimately that's why he's here over Ramsdale, right? It's because Arteta has more confidence in Ray on the ball. So Ray has to continuously show that. Yeah, I mean, until it goes flies in the back of the net because he does something wrong. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, I feel like 
nobody ever takes into consideration that it's going to go wrong at some point that you take the risk or whatever. I remember when we played against Manchester City and uh, Alvarez almost like blocked it and went into the back of the net and everybody was like panicked. And I'm just like, I don't know if you got like, I watch tons of Premier League games, tons of football games. When goalkeepers play off of the back, totally like there's so many mistakes that are made. So he's going to make mistakes, but I think they need to be more fewer and far between. And I can accept the playing out from the back mistakes. The ones that I don't like are the Luton throwing it into your own net type of mistakes. But, you know, just keep playing out from the back and being confident because we definitely need to like kick on from this goalkeeper thing because it was getting to be like very tiring. Now, Trossard, he scored the goal. He's been having a difficult time, I feel like. I feel like in the last couple of like weeks, there's been a lot of criticism around Trossard. Like he doesn't play good on the wing. You know, he's he's not playing well, blah, blah, blah. And I don't necessarily feel like he had a great game against Palace, but he did score a goal. And I feel like the goal that he scored showed what his main quality is, which is finishing inside the box. Like he's just one of those types of players that when he's in and around the box, he tends to make things happen. And so Trossard is somebody to me that like, we desperately need to like get going just like everybody else. But it was nice to see him score a goal and get a little bit of confidence um, as well as Martinelli, because it does kind of feel like everybody needs a goal, right? Like almost everybody needs a goal. Is anybody in form? It doesn't feel like it, you know? So it was nice to see a couple of them get some goals, you know? I think with Trossard as well, like you said, just his, you know, one of the reasons we bought him is his, you know, composure and his finishing in the past couple of, you know, performances, some of his shots have just been wild. And obviously he's, he's, you know, he's got a great shot on him. It's really, really powerful. But in the kind of previous games, I'm just like, you're nowhere near, you know, you're blazing it over the bar. It's, you know, it's really lacking that kind of, you know, composure and it reeks of someone who's trying super hard as all of the players are. Um, But that kind of finesse is gone. And that's why there's a little kind of, second version of the goal that we scored that keeps replaying in my mind where he misses it and I can't get it out of my head because I think we would have had a collective meltdown but the skill to essentially sit the defender down and kind of you know with a decent amount of power but the right placement I'm hoping that is kind of a bit of restoration for him that his his strength for us is finishing um not doing these kind of like wild um you know just completely taking the wrong option so I'm hoping that for Trossard as all of them it's just like right remember what you're good at and go and do it a bit more like keep it simple yeah I'm glad he's off corners as well because his corners (laughs) were doing my fucking head in oh my god (laughs) they were kidding me I was like oh why is this still happening he just kept on taking them and just kept kept, on and then they get worse and worse and worse and worse and you're like what what are you what are you trying to do here i i can't even i don't even know what you're trying to do here but all of them are rubbish in different ways Mm. so maybe the pressure of taking corners was just weighing his shoulders down and now he can't now he doesn't have to take corners i mean it's our biggest it's our bread and butter if you can't take our corners what's your what's the use you know that is who we are corner but yeah i was quite uh, I was quite surprised he started because I thought it would have been a really good game to start Martinelli just to get his confidence back. But it's worked well for us because both have come on and or sorry, both players have scored. But I thought, yeah, Trossard was was OK, like overall. He was he was I wouldn't say he had like a great game. I think he was like solid, scored a really good goal. And yeah, and I'm I'm totally cool with that. I think, like you say, this season, our substitutes just felt like they haven't been making an impact often enough. So if we can have him and Martinelli rotating on that left hand side, and both are contributing. It's obvious, but that, that's where we need to be. Um, so, yeah, so please, he's back on the score sheet. And it'll be interesting to see who Arteta goes with against Forrest. Um, I want... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, just saying, because I don't know if Trossard has done enough to earn himself a start or if, um, yeah, if Arteta will just be scared to rotate. So he might keep it the same. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what, what he does on the left-hand side now. It's interesting because, like, as 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 critical as people have been about uh, Trossard, he has... 20 um, goals and assists or like 20 GA like since for a, in a year with very minimal minutes you know so for a player that we spent like what 27 million on or some nonsense like that I think he's been worth the fee um he's what he is like he's a stop gappy squad guy that has a lot of quality but probably will never break into the starting 11 and that's fine 
Um, I think you just want to get like the Jada effect from him, you know, and I feel like we've lost a little bit of that because maybe he, like you guys said, he lost a little bit of confidence. He was snatching at things. He was on nonsense for a while, but hopefully this settles him down because we need that. And, you know, Martinelli comes in uh, those last 25 minutes and scores the two goals, the Henri S goals. They were very similar. Like it was strange because you just looked away and then he scored an, another one very similarly to the to the first one. How badly do we need Martinelli? Like it's Martinelli needs it, but Arsenal, like they, like we need Martinelli to score goals, you know? So how important was it for him to get going? Because like, I, he just has not been himself, but I'm not sure. And we'll talk about it if it's all, if it was all him or was the tactics or what, but how important is it to get Martinelli going? I was excited to see those two goals. It's not gonna lie. There was no way in my heart I knew that I was going to miss those goals. I think in my head it was like, I, I looked up and I was like, I remember it was the, the pass from Jorginho. I was like, surely this is off. There's no way. They can't, they can't be this bad. There's what? And then like, I look, the, the, the Lions judge was like, no, play on. And then it was just him and keeper. And he had already just scored from that same angle. So I was like, yeah, no, we're good. So I'm happy. I just think. I'm still like it didn't answer enough questions for me, and and it sucks because it 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 just it looks so bad because it looks like I'm like this Martinelli hater and I'm not. I just I mean, it, in my that, that is what it is. But continue. You see, I I can't I can't win with this. I I as just soon know. As you said it sucks. <laughs> it didn't yeah, no, I, it, it, like it sucks because it's like the issues we've had is is it's it's settled play that is that is this is where majority like in the december period where we couldn't score goals our biggest issues was settled play and i was like hey yeah i mean in terms of transition and stuff like that but in terms of what do we do when it's time for us to make collective decisions together i think all everyone in that front line still hasn't been doing enough in the final third when there's eight players in the box and and the the windows are really small. What are we doing collectively as a team? We're not doing there, but to get those goals and to be able to kind of just let you know, even just because at the end of the day, he is still twenty two years old. Just for him to see those goals go in, for him to score twice, even seeing him as like a hug. I, yeah, I love it. I just want us to be able to be able to score a set set settled play goal from our front line. That is just kind of where my concerns are still. Like, can we score a goal collectively when teams decide, hey, we are not, we do not care what you do before you get into the box. When the box, we're going to stand still and you're going to have to find a way to like not kick the ball to a corner. I mean, so. Martin, Martinelli is a, uh, he's cash money when, you know, the, the defense is tired and there's space in behind. Like, he's cash money. Um, I do think there's questions around, you know, if we're going up against deep blocks, how how good would he be? You know, because you need to be more patient and the space isn't there. And his that's his bread and butter is just running onto the ball and just putting it in the back of the net. So I think the game state and Crystal Palace being horrendous definitely suited that for him. So I get what you're saying about like it didn't answer enough questions. But I also feel like somebody that I feel like maybe didn't have a lot of confidence just scoring two goals might get that going but there's still to me like you know i just i don't know I, I just don't you know when martinelli gets into situations where there's a lot of people around him i don't know if he makes the right decision all the time so i'm happy about those two goals for sure because we need to get him going and i i don't know what nottingham forest will do because i don't watching them yesterday against like brentford or whatever i don't know what they're gonna do but i would imagine martinelli will come back in and start mm. who knows what it'll shout, be out like. to, shout out to James Tompkins, by the way, who came on for Crystal Palace to shore things up and just dropped an absolute stinker in about five minutes. Just like left his centre back position like twice, and Martinelli scored goals. I was like, "Where is Rob Holding?" Just out of interest, what's happened to Rob He's Holding? He's injured. How do you get is injured? He really injured? When you don't play. Is he injured? I don't think I just... he's played a single minute for them, has he? No, he hasn't. No, I think he's just played in like the cup competition. I thought it was just on some sort of like hiatus. And he's uh, pursuing his like career as a country music fan because I just haven't seen him play any any minutes for Crystal Palace. But yeah, uh, it was good to see Martinelli score a, a couple of goals. I think um, I understand what um, Femi's saying, which is what I was hinting to at the start of the 
podcast. So I did say, yeah, it was cool, but I want to see more. But then all you yeah. all said, oh, well, well, you have to be happy. But now Femi's saying, well, you want to see more from Martinelli. So, okay. I well, his agenda that. is against Martinelli. Yeah, so we have okay. about all of it, it. But when Martinelli yeah, scores, yeah. we have yeah. to have more conversations. Yeah. So what yeah. I would say is that hopefully the goals maybe release that pressure and anxiety that he's got when he's playing. And hopefully yeah. in those tight moments, he can perform a little bit more free. I think, as we've said anyway, his dribbling style is a bit head down and different. So when the games are tight, he doesn't really have that like Robert Perez, like Sam in Nasri way of like beating a player. Uh, maybe he can develop that into his game. I personally don't think that is his game. So I think it's just about when those games are really, really tight. That's when I would say, right, let's, you know, move you inside in the box a little bit more and you can finish instinctively as opposed to be involved in the approach play. But that doesn't seem like Arteta wants to do that because he's always hugging the touchline. Um, but yeah, against a team like Forest, you imagine because they're at home, they, they might try to come at us a little bit. And even though they're near the bottom of the league, they do play fairly adventurous football. So there might be some space in behind. Um, and yeah, it'd be good to see if Martinelli can carry on because I think that's just four goals for him this season, which is a, you know a massive drop off in comparison to last season. So hopefully yeah. he can yeah he can just carry on and, and you know end the season with, with ten plus goals and yeah. Before before la- uh, yesterday's game, it was uh, up until like at this point in the season, Martinelli and Jesus together had like twelve goals. And before yesterday's game, they only had five. So that's a massive drop off from the two yeah, of them. Yeah, it's huge. It's that's huge. a massive drop off. So they need to get going. And I'll be honest, like I'll say this, I still think Jesus had a sinker. I'll be honest. I, I don't think I'm still I'm worried about him because mm. it's just like uh he's had about four good months at Arsenal, in my opinion, in the two seasons that he's been here. Um, and we have seen nothing of the player that was played against Leicester last season. To me, that was his best performance for Arsenal. We've seen a little bit of it in the Champions League, but I feel like if we're honest, like, or at least if I'm being as honest as I can, as somebody that loves Gabriel Jesus, it's giving Lacazette, and I don't want to see Lacazette. Ooh. It's I think it's hard. Hard. Yeah, just, <laughs> Femi, Femi, you yeah, go a second. But, that, yeah, all I'd say hard. is that, like, the benefit of the doubt I'd give him is that it's his first game back after a little injury. So that's one little benefit of the doubt. But I definitely agree with you. I wanted to see more yesterday, but maybe he just wasn't able to give it. But if he can just focus on, on, on staying, staying on, on his feet, you know, staying on side, definitely. You know, <laughs> stop taking these silly dives because they're really annoying. And the more the more silly dives you take, the less I'm glad you said get. that. I see Jota today, right? Jota probably should have a penalty today, but I think his dive the other week was probably the referee's mind, and they were like, "No, you just play on." And then just like simplify things a little bit. Sometimes I feel like he is always trying to prove that he's Brazilian. So when he gets the ball, everything's got, he's got to do something all the time. And I'm like, you can't just keep it simple. You don't have to like chop and chop and chop and chop and then pass. You can just like shift and shoot. So what I would say is it's probably more of a mentality thing. And if you can adopt the mentality of I want to be a goal scorer and I'm going to like hunt for goals and be a predator, I think he'll probably score a few more goals. But at the minute, it feels like he's trying to do so many things and it doesn't, it doesn't work for him. However, let's give him a run of games in the team uh, and then let's evaluate like in four or five games time before we kind of say what season it's going to be for Jesus. But I do agree with you. It's not been as, but, as but blossoming as we would have hoped. That, but that's what I'm saying. When people hear, like, I'm like, it's giving Lacazette, they're like, oh, you think he's the same level as Lacazette? That's not what I'm saying. There was, like, a point in time where Lacazette, I felt like, accepted the fact that he wasn't going to be a goal scorer and he was going to be a facilitator. And I feel like once a number nine accepts that they're not a goal scorer, they're done. You know, and it's like this mental thing where it's like they're trying to do all the other things, but when they get in front of goal, they look like they've seen a ghost. And I'm afraid that Jesus is getting a little bit like, snatching at shots, looking afraid to do the the business in front of goal. And he's also lost a little bit of that creativity in the jinky jinky. Like it's, it's, I'm like, it's like a big hole in, in the, in the center forward position. Like it, it is. And so I'm waiting for him to, to start looking like the player from last season, because I can accept that Jesus knowing that that Jesus is not going to score a lot of goals, but this one, this one's not really, it's not moving me the way that I feel like it should. You know? Amazing cheekbones, though. His, cheek, his cheekbones are still absolutely incredible. Probably the best sure. cheekbones in the Premier League. <laughs> See, Not better than Kamiyasu. 
Tommy. Yeah, I know. But with, with Tommy Asu, it feels a little bit more awkward, though. He's just not as cool with it. Gabriel <laughs> Jesus. It's kind of kind of got it. But go on, Femi. Sorry. No, you're fine. It's just funny coming after what I said about Martinelli. I'm going to then say I think we're being a little harsh on Jesus. Just a tur- just a turd bit a little harsh. I I know. I know, Jess. I know what you're going to say. But I think there's there's something about having someone like Jesus that it's interesting because it's like if you look at him as simply as a nine, then everything you guys say is completely justified. But it's like there's just so many other things that he offers that sometimes I'm just kind of like, mm, okay, I'll let it slide. For instance, uh, and I re- only remember it because of the fact that like I watched it like eight times. There was a sequence of play at the two minute thirty four second mark. The ball somehow gets to Saka. It goes to Crystal Palace. It somehow bobbles his way back to Jesus. And in the midfield, even though he's a striker, beats two men, does this weird spin move, cuts the ball back to the point where two Crystal Palace players collide. And then he cuts inside where now he's running into space where it's now a four on two with, I think it was like uh, Trossard, Havertz, him, Saka, all running against two Crystal Palace players. And then he just fluffs the pass. And I'm like, "Mm." okay. I remember that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, but at the same time, it's like you have moments like that or some of the fluffs he has or him just kicking it to players where they're blocked and you're kind of like, you probably didn't need to shoot that. But then he ends the game with four chances created with two being big chance created. And you're like, okay. And I remember there was a point in time where we had another striker who in his, you know, in his glory days was scoring goals left and right and winning golden boots and all that. But then when he wasn't scoring, was offering absolutely nothing. So it, I'm already I'm already in the hot seat for killing left sided inside forwards. I don't want to add another one to the list. And then now all of a sudden I just hate left wingers. So I'm staying away from that. But I just I don't know. I, I have a soft spot for Jesus because again, like Harry said, he is just coming back from injury after coming back from another injury the season before that. And it's like to be able to catch form and try to still be in. I'll be honest with you, we say like silly, you know, silly dives, but then I'm also watching my rivals get those same pens. I'm watching the same, those same things that he's doing or the same, like literally like I watched uh, the the Jota, like Jota pen he got like that. Because if he doesn't go down, I remember there was a game, I forgot what game it was, when Sakai literally gets like cleared and he jumps over the guy and we're like, why didn't you go down? But then at the same time, it's like Jesus is also getting contact and he is going down. But now we're like, oh, so it's kind of like, yeah, trying to find the balance. I, mean, I, know, yeah, I know what you're saying, but it's, these are like, these like, oh, the arms yeah. go and then it's the oh, yeah, roll. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's it's dramatic. Like, mad dramatic. Yeah, yeah, mad, 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 mad dramatic. Desperation. Yeah, it's, it's just a little bit like, desperation. But, uh, that's no, face, know, you know the face really. he gives, like when, like after he gets them, he doesn't get a close, like. His eyebrows it's, are like through his hairline. They're so high. They just disappear up into his hair. They're nuts. <laughs> no, it's it's hilarious. I don't know. I he needs to he needs uh, to do better shooting. I sorry to bring a downer on this, but I'm running out of patience with Gabriel Jesus. I am I am running out of patience because I think what he is giving us is so far from what he is capable of, and I don't see any signs of getting back to that. The Man United goal when he basically we scored that third goal. And I'm like, wh- how we, how can you go from that to, I think I mean, you just said it, you, the, sh- the, sh- the number of shots that he takes, which get blocked. I'm like, that's that we are beyond you being unlucky. You're now just desperate. And I would question whether he is part of our long-term success, unless he can literally turn it around right now, because I am, I am losing patience and I'm, that's just I'm just being honest but yeah but you know what though like I don't I don't feel like that's unfair I feel like the player that he was last season was flawed but very useful for us and so you could see how even if you got another striker how Jesus would be useful to the team the way that he's played since he's gotten that injury in the World Cup is not a player that I feel like is untouchable because that player doesn't offer enough and that, like, I just don't, I'm not saying, and that, I don't think you're saying, and I'm not saying sell him tomorrow. I'm just saying that if this continues from now until the end of the season, 
we're having a much different conversation than if he can even be the player that he's been in the Champions League, which, I mean, that's still not even the version from last season, but at least it's closer than what we're seeing now. There are, there are games that are going by in the Premier League where Gabriel Jesus is just not effective. He just, I'm just calling it like how yeah, I see it. I think it. The, uh, the mentality thing that you mentioned, I think is, is really important. And for some reason, I keep on talking about Danny Welbeck on these podcasts, but when we signed Danny Welbeck off Man United, right, there were, it's not a similar vibe, but there was like a really good player at Man United and, and it wasn't quite working out for him. And you, we, I don't know, I thought, man, if you give this guy like a run up front, he will score you goals. And I think in Welbeck's debut against Man City, maybe chipped Joe Hart and hit the post. And I think he scored a hat-trick in the Champions League a few weeks after. And you almost had this feeling like, oh, if Danny Welbeck can like stay fit, he could lead the line and, and score a lot of goals. But then what happens is for the player, there's like an acceptance of, do you know what? Maybe I'm not clinical. Maybe this will never be me. So I'm going to overcompensate in other areas. And then exactly. they become like this they become like this utility man. And it's not to liken it to James Milner, but it's kind of a similar thing where James Milner is a really good central midfielder, but he could never We're really find a... No, but yeah, but I mean, he, he could never really find a, like a space in the team. So he became like this really good utility man. And I think for Gabriel Jesus, he's in danger of becoming a Dirk Cow slash Danny Welbeck utility man where you're just playing him wide to use him because he's really useful as a team player, but he can't give you enough in what you want him to do. So that's why I talk about like, he just needs to say, well, I want to score goals and I want to stay in the box. Now, I don't know if Arteta is telling Gabriel Jesus, you do all these things and I'm happy for you to do that. I'm happy for you to go left, right, drop in and take these touches and win fouls and mm -hmm and get Sacra Martinelli in behind or whatnot. Maybe that's the instruction. But, because it feels like at the minute, right, and Ketia, when he comes up on front, he is just staying in that one, like, area and not doing all of those things. And Jesus is doing the total opposite, and Jesus is being everywhere. So I feel like Jesus has to have a chat with himself in the mirror and say, I am a goal scorer. I can score goals and score goals. Um, and then I we mean, can see. But I, th I think it's too, I I'll be honest, I feel like it's too early to write him off yet because of those injuries and the stop, start, yeah. stop, start, stop, start. So let's see where we are in like three, four games time. Um, you better not get another injury though, Harry, for sh I'm for real. I'm yeah, so well, serious. Do not get another injury because you are becoming you, one of my nightmares, which is an injury prone player. I don't like it. I can't. He needs to I, stay I'll fit. say that we're, I'll say that we're like one, like he came to Arsenal with everyone, with pretty much him telling Arteta and the rest of the world, I am a striker. We are a couple games away from us saying, yeah, no, it's okay. You, it's we're, so we're fine. Far away. <laughs> and I, it's to put, and it's crazy because it's like, if we buy, if we end up splashing big, which I eventually think we will be splashed on a striker. I don't want to hear interviews about how like Arteta gave up on him. I don't want to hear, like, you know, like, I came to Arsenal as a striker because, honestly speaking, he'd solve our right-wing depth issues if we bought a striker. Perfect right-winger for us. If Saka's not healthy, though Jesus there, I'm not complaining. I don't think anyone here would be start complaining, especially games where we think he's, uh, Saka needs a bit of rest. Challenge for Martinelli on the other side as well. If we have, like, you know, a big number nine, it's kind of like, okay, we have it there, but we cannot blame anyone. Like, he kind of, like, the looking to, look to the mirror thing, 100% because there's certain moments where you kind of just look at Jesus where it's like he kind of looks at the camera and everyone like, oh, I'm so unlucky. And we're like, no, we watched it. Stop. We saw you. We saw it. It's okay. So I'm kind of over it. <laughs> it's. I'm trying not to be harsh, but we're not that far away from having this conversation. And also just before we end this part, because we have to talk about some of the other midfieldy stuff. Tony was getting a lot of gas yesterday for a performance that I've seen from Gabriel Jesus. The only difference between that performance and what we get from Jesus is the free kick that should not have stood. Tony did nothing in the box. He didn't create it. He didn't, he didn't have any shots on goal besides the one that he scored off the free kick. I'm sorry, but I'm looking at another Jesus that's just taller in English. I am so... No, I'm sorry. Mm -mm. Nothing in the box. Everybody was, oh, look at the link-up play. I don't want to see that. I want you to see... Come on, back in the net. I want to see shots. 
flying in the back of the net. I'm sorry. Like, be serious. Arsenal fans, be serious. We need a different type of striker. Arteta, be serious. Do not go get this I think we're being unfair. I think we're being unfair. He only had three touches in the box. He only had three touches in the box. He had more. He had more passes into the final third than he had touches in the box. Don't do this to my man. Stop. No. If, If Arteta, I bet you Arteta is sitting there with Edu and saying, my striker needs to be a facilitator. I want him coming into midfield and creating chances and stuff because there is no way that you go from Jesus to Tony and what you want from your striker is somebody that's going to bag hella goals because both of those players like to do all their work outside of that box. Like, feel, Tony was getting like gassed the, um... so badly. And I was like, did you guys watch the same game I watched? He didn't do nothing in the box. No, I, I, I got to say, I don't like Tony, as, as I've made it clear. But I thought he actually had quite a, an impressive game overall, considering it was his first game back. There was a lot of nice play, like, from wider positions. But I, I know what you're saying. He didn't lead the line as maybe we expect him to see. Maybe that was more of, like, a fitness issue. He kind of took more of, like, a playmaker role. But, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm sick and tired. I feel like I've been hearing about Ivan Tony like, the whole week, every single day of my life. And I just feel like... And at the end of the match, it's like, yeah, I manifested this. I was like, oh, my God, fuck <laughs> oh my off. God. You were banned like, oh, for betting. This is not some like glorious return. Voice it's so unreal much. what like, what Sky did. The the coverage yeah, was like PR, I know. I, have I tuned into like some sort of testimonial here, or are I we know. in fact watching a player who was banned for? Do you know what I mean? I'm like, am I am I, am I taking crazy pills here, or like yeah. are we just celebrating this player? Yeah, I was like, am I in the wrong? Am I the one that's been arrested and he's the free man? Am I guilty? And he is the victim in all of this? It was just all so confusing. So I re- I'm i actually starting to think that the whole Tony to Arsenal rumours is just a massive smoke screen. Like, to drive up the be. price, drive up the price, get Chelsea to pay stupid amounts of money for him and we've got something else lined up. Because the more I hear him talk, I think to myself, there's no way Arteta would sign this sort of player. There's a picture of him on, like, the Daily Mail, like, with his hat rolled up, like, no shirt on and his beard all scruffy, like, like, he survived, like, I don't know, like, months and months and months in the desert. I'm like, what is going on? Like, it's who is so dramatic. You? It's, it's so ridiculous. dramatic. ridiculous. Honestly. I feel and like he's going to release, like, a rap album next week and then a film a week after and then, like, a life coaching course. I'm just like, give it a fucking rest, mate, all right? Give it a rest. You're doing my nutting. <laughs> The PR job that's been done should, I mean, whoever the PR person is deserves a raise because they have gaslit us into thinking that the guy was not banned for something that he literally did. Like, it's it's actually insane. But I do, we do have some other things that I want to touch on. Um, Arsenal Twitter, I could argue down about some of these cameos and the gas that was coming from them, but it's okay. Um, good cameos, look bright. Jorginho, the pass that he put in for Martinelli was great. Camille Smith Rowe did some good things. I want to ask you guys, like, what your opinions are on, like, so we're going to play against Nottingham Forest. I'm, I'm almost 100% sure Kai Havertz will start. But in the event that he does not start, who gets the nod? Does Jorginho come in and do the double pivot with Declan Rice providing he's fit? Or does Emile Smith Rowe take Havertz's position? Because both have been thrown out there based on these cameos. And I think, you know, when you're starving, a lot of things look great. And I feel like people would want anybody but Kai Havertz in that position. But, Harry, if, if you were picking the team for Nottingham Forest and provided that Declan Rice was not injured, what would you do? Would you go with Jorginho next to Declan Rice and do what we did against Liverpool? Or would you maybe give Emil Smith Rowe an opportunity to, to really show what he can do? Because without a run of games, I don't think we'll truly know what a Smith Rowe is capable of. Yeah, it's a good question. I think I'd actually do something totally different. I'd ring up Xabi Alonso and get Granit Xhaka back on loan. Perfect. For for like three to six months and just start him left centre. <laughs> Alone. Um, uh, yeah, I oh, it's a really tough one, right? Because I actually think Forest aren't a bad side, and like I said earlier, they do you know they do attack quite well and they do play you know quite brave football. So. I think, yeah, so if Declan Rice is injured, I think I'd go with Jorginho and Havertz. If Declan Rice is fit, I think I would go with Jorginho and Rice, just for more control away from home. And then, yeah, then I'd bring on, you know, a Havertz or an Emil Smith-Rowe. 
The only problem with that is it means that it's likely that someone of Martinelli, Emil Smith, or own Havertz doesn't make uh, doesn't make the pitch because it's unlikely that Arteta would make all of those three subs. But just to be cautious, yeah, I would be tempted to start Jorginho and and Rice. I actually think Havertz had a decent enough game against Palace, not in terms of like impressing from an attacking perspective, but in terms of doing a job of a midfielder and just moving the ball. And also he moved it a little bit quicker, not as quick as I would have liked, but he still was passing it quicker. And it was almost like one, two touch in there. So I think if he can carry that on and then impose his attacking game, I think um, that will work quite well. But yeah, I'd be tempted to go with Georgina and Rice. Um, however, if uh, sorry, Rice is fit, then I wouldn't be surprised if he just does Rice habits. I feel like Arteta doesn't rotate too much nowadays. I might be wrong, but it feels like the, same players pretty much start Settled. all the time. So, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And Havertz away from home because of his aerial threat is always um, always handy. So, yeah. I haven't really answered your question, but, yeah. Uh, Granite Xhaka is welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Laura, what do you think? Did you like Emil Smith-Rose cameo? Did you think it was as good as everybody else did? <laughs> no. The three touches I, that he I, had? I think he was okay but we were winning and Palace were like on the bus home so I, I don't really think we can give a huge amount of like praise I'm so, I'm being so negative right now but it was okay I think he was I think someone described him as bright in one of the kind of the kind of write-up so I'm like fine that's that's an adequate adjective for someone who came on but we were winning easily and did some nice things I don't think Arteta's gonna start him I, d- I don't know I can't see it happening. Um, And I don't even know if he'll come on because that was the longest I think he's come on for in terms of subs. Like he threw him on at the end of one of the previous games for like three minutes. Um, And so I just, I I think I I agree with Harry. I think, I think he he is settled now in, in who starts. And for me, I think that might've been a kind of final, it, it was almost like a pointless substitution really, because, he obviously wanted to give him some minutes, but I'm like, what do you expect him to do in this position here? If he scores a goal, then it, you know, great, we're winning already and the game is won. If he doesn't, then, you know, he's not taking his opportunity to get minutes. So I don't think he could, you know, it was kind of like a lose-lose situation for him there. I don't agree that it was like an amazing cameo. I've seen loads of stuff on Twitter and people are just losing their minds at how good it was. And I'm like, I, I'm not sure what you're watching. It, it was it was good, but he is a good player. Uh, and so I'm absolutely not answering your question as well, Jess. So I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> don't need I... to know what Femi thinks because no. you're just gonna say Keith Everton. So um, let's fast forward. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, go um, ahead, go ahead. What's crazy is like I actually liked the ASR, like I, I really liked the ASR cameo, but it was less of what he did on the ball. I think it was just more of the positions he was when Palace decided to they wanted to press us. I think Havertz kind of floats further forward because he wants to be with the forward line and if he has to get the ball, he'll you know, get the ball, kind of drag people and then pass it. But ESR was kind of more of looking for the ball. It's kind of like he, come, he came to space and he was attracting certain players, which then made spaces for other players. And then we were able to kind of like quickly go. I think he needs to get better with defensive duels. I don't think he's the greatest yet there um, at the moment, um, which kind of gives me a little, especially since that's our bread and butter. And if one area, if you're compact and one area is weak and then it kind of all crumbles like a domino piece. So that kind of is like a, uh, but I think with time as well with age and game experience that will come. Um, but all in all, like, again, like I, I see Havertz as kind of like the aerial threat. And I think ESR is more of like, I'm going to sit further, a little further up kind of where Odegaard is, but on the left-hand side. And it's different. I, again, I like different. I, 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 it's like, I don't see it as one or the other. It's like, I have a bunch of these tools and I'm going to use this tool when I need it. They're both different temperaments different mindsets, different, they're just different players to me. So I, I just think it just depends. I feel like the question shouldn't be who should start based off of like who did the best the other day. I think it's how do you think um, non-force is going to play us? If they're going to press us crazy, I think Smith Rowe should start. If you feel like they're going to sit back and we don't need that much help in the buildup, then I think you should, yeah, throw some bodies forward and, and let's, let's punish them for not trying to get the ball from us. But again, Pick your poison FC is what I think Arsenal should be versus every day we need to pick either Havertz or ES or no. It's what yeah. problem do we think we're going to need to solve and use those tools you have to solve them. Do yeah, you know I what? think, I think uh, the word, okay. sorry. Yeah, no, just with ESR, it, it just feels like we're running out of games, if that makes sense, for him to really like make an impact this season. 
And because we're out of the cup competitions, there's naturally less minutes where he's guaranteed to start. And every game is like so, so important because we're far behind uh, Liverpool. And when you talk about, when you mentioned it's just about, you know, using your tools or knowing when to use them. But that's the thing with uh, with um, ESR. He's got like potentially maybe one or two positions on the pitch where Arteta trusts him, maybe left mid and, and left eight. Whereas if you think about how many, you know, poor games Saka's had this season or how many games where Saka's just been dead on his feet. And I'm just thinking, why are we not trying ESR out right midfield to give us something different? Like, why are we not just trying more of a possession paced dribbler who doesn't just want to cut inside and cross, who's happy to like, you know, try and beat his man and play a one-two with someone in the box, just a different style to Saka. And, and so that's like the frustration for me a little bit, because I feel I agree with Laura, like I get it and it was good to see, but I'm just like, Oh, but what, what does it mean, though? Like, what does it mean going forward? Because I'm pretty sure no matter how Nottingham Forest set up, there's no way Emil Smith-Rowe starts against Nottingham Forest. One, because yeah. he's just probably not match fit. And even when he has been match fit, he still hasn't started for Arsenal. So even how Forest set up, I think he's probably third in the pecking order for that left eight role behind Declan Rice or Havertz, however you're going to do it with Jorginho. So I was pleased to see him come on and do something different and show us what we know he can do, which is play on the half turn and and carry the ball and just be a little bit more of like that De Bruyne type player that we mentioned. But I'm just I'm just a little bit like, oh, I just want to see it now. And I almost want him to start a few games so we can see is keeping this guy in the squad because we know we can and just to keep him around rather than really using him. Like so yeah, like it was a really nice cameo. But for me it's like cool, stay fit start some games, score some goals, and let's go. Otherwise, it's just going to be really frustrating to watch over the next the next season. It feels like a cycle with, with ESR. Yeah. Like, play a game, bright, everybody gets gassed, gets injured, out for a while, don't like the player that's there, gas up ESR while he's injured, gets a minute. Like, I could make one of those graphics of the cycle of ESR. You know, until yeah, yeah. he can stay fit and play multiple games in a row, I just. It's, Do you know what would difficult. make me feel better? It's just knowing what's happened, and obviously we will never get to know. But I'd love to know because obviously you read the comments from Arteta, and it's great. I love Emil Smith Rowe, blah 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 blah. Emil Smith Rowe, I love Arsenal, blah 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 blah. But I'd love to know what's actually happened over the past year, so I can either show you some empathy, or I can be like, right, well, you need, well, as a fan, I think you know you need to start doing this. But I'm just yeah. unclear as to. What has happened why? with Emil Smith Rowe? Yeah, and why it's happened apart from injuries, and why he hasn't been used a lot. And um, like, why? Why? Sorry to go back, but why is Arteta so reluctant to use him as a right midfielder uh, with with ten minutes to go? I the only thing I'll say is I'm very particular with the type of injuries players have when they have injuries. That first one with the knee was so devastating because it was like the rehab that had to go directly after it as well as when it happened. Like I saw yesterday, I was like, okay, we, we saw some rhythm. And then when he got injured, and then he had the rehab to the point where he literally didn't play towards the end of last season. We came into the summer, we're like, you know what, he's doing the rehab, we could see him. And then even coming into the beginning of this season, he didn't start majority, he didn't play like that in the beginning of the season. So it's kind of like, okay, maybe he's still kind of rehabbing. I think he got like two appearances that were over 60 minutes. After the second one, he's feeling... He's feeling things in his knee, not to mention before that I'm pretty sure it was the groin injury in which is like I, when I coached, I had this one player, one of my most talented players, and he had this lingering groin injury where he, like we'll go three, four weeks, he would never feel it. I was like, you know what, are you sure you can play? He's like, yeah, I'll play. 20 minutes, coach, coach, my, my groin, I'm like, okay, it's fine, it's fine. So it's just tricky with spe specifically those two injuries he had with the knee and groin, where it's like, I can, I can see the back and forth that he has with not only Arteta, but the medical staff of kind of like, when does it make sense for him to get a run of games? Because once a player starts having reoccurring groin injuries or reoccurring knee injuries, either of the two, especially at a young age, it's hard. So I hear, yeah. I hear Harry, I agree with him because I do want to, like, I didn't think about him at the right wing spot. Now, like my mind is kind of like doing some things like, hmm, I kind of like that. That makes sense. But at the same time, I'm also scared of him doing the thing Partey did. I don't know if you remember two seasons ago against Spurs, where like literally like he was injured and then like he finally came back and like remember the first game he was ready to go, we let him go. And then like during a counter, he's like, 
yeah he starts walking to our tent just like yeah i, I just I'll can't never run understand i'm sorry that moment i think about that like every once in a while <laughs> Why i think it's scarred our tent I think it scarred him. I think it's like it was one of those things because I remember the conversation of like, why would you let Partey play so soon? Like he literally just came back from injury. Why would you do that? Anyone with a brain would have known that. Yeah. But it's like it's I, I don't know. Injuries are crazy. It's like the lottery, man. Like I tell it's the injuries are like lottery. It sucks. Yeah. Well, all I have to say is that I would love for Emil Smith Rowe to start. I don't mind if Jorginho sits in next to Declan Rice, but somebody needs to establish themselves before the king comes back. Fabio Vieira. A couple of weeks, my boo will be back. I thought He'll you meant back. Granite Jacker. I thought he was actually going to come back. I thought you were back no. to some breaking news. <laughs> I was thinking, who is she talking about? <laughs> Same. I was like, who are you? I've forgotten no, about then I, then Fabio Vieira, but we're coming back. Okay? I was like, no, you want Timber to play eight? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, you watched that compilation, didn't you? That, you watched that Vieira compilation that was on Twitter the other day. Uh, that's why. Oh, it's a, oh, absolutely. I was yeah. like, he's cooking when he goes. No, he's not. Co- it's the fact that you called him my boo as well. I've never, I've never thought of a player that you would use that word with less than Fabio Vieira. He's a skinny little runt. Oh, he's not shit. your boo. Laura, don't come for me. Is that, the end, of the, is that the end of your description for Vieira? Skinny little runt? That's it? Yeah, that was it. Skinny little runt. That's it. It? I'm glad you said run <laughs> and not the other one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think people are forgetting as well that like the timetable for Thomas Partey is actually a forest too, I think. So maybe maybe he'll be back in the fold, but I don't know if we have to hide him until AFCON is over. Yeah, you know? but just quickly then, not to go on ESR too much, but then, I mean, I would never facilitate a loan move because as we saw on the weekend, he got some minutes. But then just say, for example, Party does come back and then Vieira does come back, and let's assume they stay fit, then where where do the minutes for ESR come from? And then long-term, would he not benefit from a loan? Obviously, right now, it feels like, no, we can't loan him out because we don't have enough options. But if yeah. Party and Vieira, yeah, get back, then, yeah, what use does a 20-minute ESR cameo do for us, like, over the course of the season? I don't want to sound too negative, but I'm just, I'm just thinking, like, long-term, like, what's... What's the plan? But um, I'm sure we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But I feel like I feel like it's a fair question. Yeah, for sure. Well, we have Nottingham Forest coming up. Arsenal, you know, we bounce back, guys. As negative as this whole podcast sounded, we bounce back. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but um, yeah, well, this will come out. You guys will be listening to this on Monday. So make sure you guys, you know, like this and subscribe to the channel because it's actually this will be on Shino's Arsenal YouTube channel so you guys can look at it there. It would also be Spotify, Apple, those types of places as well so you guys can listen to it on your morning drive, whatever. Because as soon as I'm done recording, I'm going to edit it and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, we look forward to the weekend where we get to play another game and watch Arsenal do their thing. I have really enjoyed this convo, even though Laura came from my neck. She, she came for my neck and she came for Fabio. I cannot believe it. I cannot believe it. Nobody loves Fabio but me. But we'll see what happens. Hopefully we don't get any bad information about Rice or Gabrielle. I am worried about those two because those are two starters. So we'll see. But um, yeah. What else, guys? That's it. That's it. So yeah. Uh, make sure you guys are following Femi and Harry and Laura on Instagram or Twitter or wherever you guys are at. I'm going to put. I'm gonna start putting your guys' information in the in the uh, description so that they can follow you guys and whenever you guys say things that they don't like they can follow you guys there make sure that they put it there and not come for me but yeah you guys um, make sure you guys like I said comment subscribe all those types of things and we'll see you guys on the next one bye guys